Hello, my name is Kent Philpott. This is program number four, or lesson number four, and this lesson is titled The Old Testament. We are doing the Christian basics. What are the basic things that Christians believe? What, what is it that, uh, let's say you were going to go to a Bible college or a seminary, what would you be taught? And although this is sort of a, uh, a shorter and simpler version of that, it's going to cover pretty much a lot of what you would learn. The Christian basics, those things that uh, it's important for Christians to be learning as they begin to grow up into the stature of the fullness of Christ, which is what it's all about. Uh, we, um, there's a passage in Ephesians chapter 2, uh, verse 10. It says, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works. So we become Christians, and then we begin the growing up process. We uh, are workers in the vineyard, in the kingdom of God, in the church, what other words you'd like to use. And so we need basic tools in which to work with. And so this is what this series on the Christian basics is about. Now, uh, lesson three, we talked about the scripture. Uh, what the scripture is, how it is that Christians view it. We refer to it as God-breathed, as inspired. <clears throat> now, in this lesson four, we're going to look at just strictly uh, the Old Testament, sometimes called different things. It can be called the Hebrew Bible. Uh, it might be called, uh, as we say, the Old Testament. It might even be called the Tanakh, although the Tanakh is, is broader range than that. Um, uh, but there are various words that can be used to describe uh, what this is. Now, the word testament means covenant, contract, agreement. We use the word old because it was the, uh, the agreement that God had with his people uh, that is revealed in the Old Testament by Moses and the prophets, and through the sacrificial system, the offering of sacrifices to cover, forgive, or atone the sins of the people. It was an agreement. <clears throat> and in the Old Testament, we find that prophets look forward to uh, another, a newer testament or agreement. There was going to be a change, a fundamental change, which was programmed right from the beginning, even in Genesis. We find this, but we have some prophets like in Jeremiah chapter 31, verses 31 to 35, that speak of a, a coming new covenant, a new testament. But you can't understand the New Testament unless you understand the Old Testament. This is why Christians are very much interested in the Bible. You go to a Bible college and seminary, and there are a whole bunch of classes on the Old Testament. You have to learn Hebrew. And that was always difficult for me, Hebrew. Wow. Um, it was a, um, uh, not, a, not an easy language because it had a different alphabet. Of course, Greek had a different alphabet, too. It wasn't the ABCs. Um, in Hebrew, it's the Alf, Aleph, Beth, Gimel. And uh, so it, it completely do sounding of the letters, completely different way of writing them and so on. And from right to left, instead of from left to right, they would write. And, but anyway, it was important to study those things. I, before I was a Christian, I grew up in a, in a portion of Los Angeles with a large Jewish population, and I would go with my friends to Hebrew school. I can remember going to the temple on uh, Saturdays and being in classes, and sometimes it was Friday afternoon. But I would go to these classes, and I'd learn a little bit of Hebrew there, and I enjoyed it. Uh, I didn't know what, what, I, what in the world I was doing there, but I was just, just with some of my friends. But at any rate, we're looking at this document we call uh, the Old Testament. Of course, the, the language is Hebrew. There are some parts in Aramaic. There are 39 books 
in the Old Testament. Now, <coughs> I hope you pardon me because I've got a little bit of a cold and have a little bit of a coughing deal going on here, but bound to determine to finish these anyway. But there are 39 books in our, let's say, the, uh, the Christian Old Testament. Uh, there, it was a different count in, uh, if, if you were a Jewish person, got a Bible from the Jewish uh, Publication Society, uh, you'd find that um, Samuel would be one book, but in ours it's two, and same with Kings. Instead of First and Second Kings, just Kings. Or instead of, in our, my Bible, First and Second Chronicles, just Chronicles. Um, and so there are different counts, um, but, um, but that's the way, the way it is in our, our Bibles that we have today what, that are produced by the Christian community. Um, so this lesson is intended to acquaint us with the general makeup of the Old Testament only. Next lesson, of course, we'll be looking at New Testament. But let me make one thing clear. It takes a lifetime of living with the Old Testament as well as the New so that we gain a real understanding of what the Old Testament says. And again, I want to state again that to understand the New Testament, to understand Jesus, the things that he said, and the other materials we find in the New Testament, it is absolutely imperative that we understand the Old Testament. The New Testament and Christianity didn't arrive in a vacuum. Its whole background is laid out in the Old Testament. Very vital then that we know what the Old Testament says. So let's take a look at the major sections of the Old Testament. We begin with the Torah, Torah means law, or the Pentateuch, the five books, uh, sometimes known as the five books of Moses, but they are Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. So these are the first five books of the Bible. In it, we have the story of the um, creation. Uh, we move along uh, through circumstances uh, like the, the flood of Noah. Before that, the Tower of Babel. Um, we have a number of different kinds of events that take place in the Old Testament. And then it moves fairly rapidly to the history of Abraham. Abraham called out of Ur of the Chaldees and brought to a place that God was going to give his people at some point. Then we have Isaac and Jacob. And then we have the Jewish people in mass, starting with 70 people being made slaves of in Egypt. <clears throat> it was <clears throat> while in Egypt that God called a man named Moses in order to bring them out of Egypt after they'd been there for 400 years. And this story is spoken of in, in Genesis and in Exodus. And so we have a, a, this long period of time of God giving the law, God establishing the sacrificial system, uh, God doing these things in preparation for his bringing his people into the promised land. That is, across the Jordan, going west, across the Jordan, into the area that we now call Israel. Modern-day Israel, sandwiched in between Egypt, Syria and, and, and Syria, and Libya in the north, Le uh, Lebanon in the north. So that's the story of the, the, old, the Old Testament's first five books. How they got where they were in the promised land, in the land of Israel. So the dates for the writing of the books is uncertain. This Genesis, Exodus, Numbers, Leviticus, Deuteronomy. But generally from the 15th to the 13th centuries B.C., that is from about 
1450 B.C. to about 1250 B.C. Um, that's when the, the dates of these books were, were written. Now, there's a lot of debates <clears throat> among Christians on, uh, on who wrote these books and when they were written. It is not a simple matter. Scholars for centuries have been weighing in on these things. And you're going to get any number of varying uh, opinions <coughs> as to who wrote what, <coughs> pardon me, and when they were written. <coughs> but <coughs> uh, it's just always going to be that there's going to be differences of opinion on that. Now, of the, the Torah, the, the books of Moses, the authors traditionally said to be Moses. But when you look at uh, the last part of Deuteronomy, you find that it's talking about the burial of Moses. So uh, he didn't write the whole thing. Um, uh, some scholars suggest that other scribes over the centuries were involved in the preparation of the books. Now, <clears throat> there is a mechanical way of looking at inspiration that a guy sat down and just started writing and his mind was in someplace else, and he was been dictated to. We call that automatic writing. <clears throat> um, that is not the way that the Bible authorship is pictured. Um, over a period of time, people worked with the Bible. That's what a lot of people say. And both liberal and conservative scholars... Uh, will acknowledge this. <clears throat> Sometimes I thought, well, if, if you said that Moses didn't exactly write everything just like it was and other people involved, I thought, well, that was liberalism until later on I, I found out that conservative Bible teachers taught exactly the same thing as well. <clears throat> the reality is we simply don't know these details. And when you're not exactly certain of the details, there's room for some varying interpretations. <clears throat> okay. So now the, the second major part of the Old Testament books are called the historical books. <clears throat> We're talking about Joshua, Judges, Ruth, First and Second Samuel, First and Second Kings, First and Second Chronicles, Ezra, Nehemiah, and Esther, historical books. Uh, Samuel, Kings, and Chronicles, they kind of denote the history of, of the, uh, the northern and southern kingdoms, the kings, the major players, and the prophets, <coughs> like Elijah. And so we find <coughs> in those historical books, those histories. By the way, Chronicles is the last book in the Hebrew Bible, but it's not. It follows um, kings. The historical books in the scripture, in the, my Bible, uh, most Protestants have is it starts with Joshua, Judges, and we go into uh, Samuel, Kings, and Chronicles. And some of the histories are duplicated. And it's interesting to look at them and compare them. So we have the historical books, <clears throat> Ezra and Nehemiah. Uh, that when the people of Israel started coming back from their exile in Babylon, uh, <clears throat> the rebuilding of uh, the city of Jerusalem and the temple, and two of the most interesting books that I just love, Ruth and Esther. Ruth, where you go, I will go. Uh, that wonderful story and the story of Esther, God's preserving his people. Uh, the dates from the, for these books, they run generally from the 14th, to the first century is really a period of about a thousand years. These historical books uh, were written, but each book has to be considered separately as to its date. The authors of these books are rarely known. Uh, many guesses have been made, but in the books themselves, uh, no author is explicitly stated. Very interesting. Um, we have these books. We think we know who wrote some of them 
or at least orchestrated uh, their, the stories being reduced to, to writing. But there, uh, there, there's no real way of knowing for sure the dates and who. But over a period of time, they became important to the people because they told the story of the people of God. Okay, now, a next major section is called the Poetic and Wisdom Books. Well, we're talking about Job, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Solomon. Now, no one wrote, knows who wrote Job or when it was written. Um, there's debates about whether it's the depiction of an actual event or whether it was a morality play, which were common in that period of time. We're probably looking at Job written maybe 9th century, 8th, 9th century B.C. The Psalms have a number of authors, primarily King David, uh, but there are other authors of the Psalms as well. Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Psalm, Song of Solomon are attributed to either Solomon or he was responsible for uh, their development. <clears throat> Again, the dates for these books uh, generally fit into the 10th to the 8th. You know, when you get into B.C., 10th is back here. 8th, 10th century is over, way over here. Eight centuries is over here, closer. Um, it's a little bit backwards, and I get a little confused myself. Anyway, so the dates for these books range from roughly 700 B.C. to 900 B.C., but those are generalized dates. So um, the next major division of the books or categories of the books are called the prophetic books, the prophetic books. Isaiah, Jeremiah, and of course, Jeremiah's Lamentations, also written by Jeremiah, but it's a lament over what had, coming, had come upon Judah. Ezekiel and Daniel, those we call generally the four major prophets. Now, the rest are called the minor prophets and largely make up one book, but they're, because they're short. Most of these books are short. Hosea, Joel, <clears throat> Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, Micah, Nahum, Habakkuk, Zephaniah, Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi. And I mentioned before that uh, Malachi is the last book in um, my Old Testament, the uh, general Christian version of the Bible. In the Hebrew Bible, uh, you will find, it, again, it's Chronicles and not Malachi. So uh, these books uh, <clears throat> arrange uh, date-wise when they were written from roughly the 4th century or the 500s uh, to the 8th century or maybe even 9th. But these, this is where, well, not the 9th. The 8th, excuse me. Um, 8th century would have been the time, for example, that Isaiah uh, was prophesying. Now, the authors of these books may actually be the very persons whose names appear in the books themselves, like Isaiah, Jeremiah. Now, Jeremiah <clears throat> probably was written by his secretary, a man, I think his name was Baruch. And uh, there were the prophets would have around them a school. Oftentimes this took place. Uh, they weren't just by themselves, but they would gather around them uh, some disciples. And uh, so there was a school of the prophets, and probably several at once at different times. And these, uh, these disciples were taught, but also assisted the prophet and may have accounted for uh, the production of the documents that we have in our Bible. They copied down what their teachers said. So uh, these are the, uh, the four major sections of, of the Hebrew Bible, uh, the Old Testament, the Torah or the Pentateuch. Um, uh, then we have the historical books, the poetic and wisdom books, 
and the prophetic books. <clears throat> and when these are studied, it is a little complicated because there's a different community involved with each of these. Uh, and there were various influences uh, with each of these. And so it is an intense and interesting um, read. And one of the things I found in trying to understand the Old Testament was to understand the culture of the day uh, and the people that were being written to, and also language peculiarities like idioms, phrases, that may have meant something to people of that day and were readily understood, but in our, our own day are not so easily understood. And uh, to find a book on, a good book on the idioms of the Old Testament is not an easy thing to do. And uh, uh, more, inter, uh, more, more easily done with the New Testament the, than the Old. So the, the study of these books is not so simple. I like to suggest uh, for people who are just getting started as uh, followers of Jesus uh, that you invest in a study Bible. And there are many good ones out there. If you uh, do an Amazon search or a Google search, you might come up with some, some good ones. There are a lot of good ones out there and uh, are useful. I remember when I was first a Christian, Billy Graham Evangelistic Association had Haley's Bible Handbook. And I got that. I sent in, I think, $10 to the Billy Graham Evangelistic Association. And then he sent me Haley's Bible Handbook. And I must have read that through three, four, five times. Uh, I wish I still had my copy, but it was a tremendous help to have something that tell you a little bit about the times, the peoples, the places, the cultures, and so on. Now, we're going to close out this lesson four with the discussion of the major themes of the Old Testament, the major themes of the Old Testament. First of all is we find that these, what I'm talking about is, is readily, clearly understood themes that we just jump out at you from the Old Testament. I'm going to give you eight of them. The first is that God is creator. By that I mean that he is the one who spoke the universe into existence. Um, it's not told how, it's just so much as it says that God created the heaven and the earth. In the beginning, God created everything that is the universe. So that is one of the major, major themes. And weren't gods and goddesses. It was one God. And a God, the God, the only true and living God, before the universe were created, there was no time and space. But in a moment, he created the heavens and the earth. All that there is in, in the universe, that which is made up of matter and energy. The second major theme is that God is personal. God is personal. In other words, he communicates with his creation. Right away in Genesis, he walks and talks with God in the cool of the day. He's personal. He communicates with us, and he made us so in his image so that we could communicate. Unlike the other animals, he's such an interesting read in Genesis, None of the other animals, creation, was able to communicate, but God made humans in his image, meaning that we could communicate with them. It's a beautiful thing. Um, so uh, the third major, a third major theme is that God is a law giver. He says yes, and he says no. He draws lines. Because he is sovereign... Because he is sovereign and in absolute control, he gives laws. He knows what is best for us, far better than we do ourselves. And so he establishes covenants or agreements with those he calls to himself. 
Another major thing about God, theme in the Old Testament is that God is holy. He is utterly separated from sin and demands holiness from from those he created. And this is a central point. Huge point. God is holy. Once we became unholy due to the fall or disobedience in the garden, something had to be done so that we could be reconciled to God. This becomes the overarching theme of Scripture, all based upon that God is holy and is absolutely separated from sin. The fifth is he is steadfast in his love for his people and provides a means for their redemption. Here is a holy God separated from his people because of sin, but the theme of Scripture, another major theme is he works to bring them back into relationship with himself. Six, he sends prophets to warn and guide his people. He sends prophets. Moses, all the way through, Joshua, Isaiah, Elijah, on and on. He sends prophets who are preachers who proclaim his word and to warn and guide his people. Seven, in the scripture, in the Old Testament, we see the presence of two messiahs or two Christs. Really one messiah, it's the two sides of the one messiah. That are very evident in the Old Testament. Messiah, son of Joseph, and Messiah, son of David. Messiah, son of Joseph, is the suffering servant of Israel. Messiah, son of Joseph. That's Messiah, son of Joseph, but the Messiah, son of David, is the conquering warrior king. And you have both of these pictures of Messiah in the Old Testament. It's right there. And we'll get to that in a number of times later on. The last theme is that through his prophets, he describes a future time when he will establish a new covenant. Very apparent in Jeremiah chapter 31. It's also in Ezekiel and other places. The Old Testament prophets look forward to a time when there will be a fulfillment of of all that God has established through the patriarchs, through Moses, and through the prophets. There's going to come a time of fulfillment, the establishing of the ultimate intention of the Creator God. It is a fascinating story. So long.